the faith of the Canaanite woman, verse 21. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Well, I'm going to pray now, and then Nick is going to come up and uh, introduce himself and speak to us on that passage. Let's pray together. Father, we pray as we look at this passage this morning, uh, and we read about this interaction that Jesus had uh, with a woman uh, thousands of years ago, that you would speak to us and leave from this passage, that you would uh, open our hearts and minds to what you are saying. Uh, in Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Morning, everybody. Morning. Morning. Bring greetings of Hebron. I know a lot of you know the people at Hebron, so greetings from Hebron. So the first thing you ask yourself, who, who am I? <laughs> well, I'm about to say, I'll give you a potted, very potted version of uh, my testimony. So I was brought up in a non-Christian home. Uh, I had a big family, a family of seven. I was the kind of like the middle one, and. We were quite poor, my mum struggled, broken family, my dad was quite a violent man and an alcoholic, so I didn't really get a very good start in life. And round about 1979-80 when I left school, it was the Thatcher era, so those of you who, not many of you I guess, will know about the Thatcher era, it was a very, very depressing time, uh, there was no jobs going, uh, there was riots everywhere, and it was a very, very bad time to as a teenager go into the world. And I started to get very, very depressed, particularly the prospect of the future, thinking that there was no future for me. I left school with nothing. I got in with the wrong crowd when I was at school, and it was a pretty poor start in life. So I met, a, well, I had a friend who had an uncle who was a Christian, and he was going through a similar situation that I was. We went to school together, right from primary school actually. In fact, we're still good friends with him to this day. And he came to me and said, Nick, I've got the answer. And I was like, what, what's, what's going on? And he said, I've got the answer. I've had a chat with my uncle and that his uncle had shared the gospel with him. So we'd spent many, many weeks debating. I, I wasn't going to accept it. Um, and I was really, really against it. Although deep down, I knew it was right. I was fighting against it, like we all do. So in about 1981, I became a Christian eventually and gave my life to God. And it all changed. I went to Hoylake Evangelical Church as a young believer for about five years and then went to London to study. Came back from London and started a church plant work in Wallasey, which really didn't turn out the way we thought it would. This is the potted version. <laughs> Eventually we went to Hebron, um, settled in there, and then my wife Jane, um, who is her brother, is a pastor, started up work in Liverpool, and we went over there with a view to help him. Well, after about two or three years, he decided to go somewhere else. So we decided to go back to Hebron. Um, so that's where I am today. I've got three children, uh, one of whom is adopted, three lovely children, um, none of them are believers, and all of them have professed faith in God and Christ, but none of them have really gone on. Um, we keep witnessing to them, we keep praying for them, of course, and I've got four grandchildren as well. So, yeah, that's me. I've been asked to come and share a word with you this morning, so I've chosen this passage here. I've been going through the Gospels in my own um, Devotion, so I thought this would be a, I came across this and it really challenged me really. So maybe just a couple of thoughts, devotional thoughts, 
on the passage. And I've just called the passage Great Faith. Great Faith. I wonder if you've been a Christian as I have for 40 years now, maybe a bit longer. There's still one thing in my life that I keep praying for. Lord, give me greater faith. Somehow I always find myself doubting God, maybe not really trusting him as I should, even after all these years as a believer. Well, this woman was commended for her great faith. So we're going to find out why Jesus commended her for a great faith and maybe apply some lessons for our own lives and pray the prayer, Lord, increase my faith. And no matter how long we've been on the Christian road, whether you're a new believer or you've been on the road for a long time, you cannot talk, say, I don't need to pray that prayer. We all need to pray that prayer. So let's notice a few things. First of all, we find in verse 21, leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Now, what is significant about that verse? Well, Canaan, which was the region of Tyre and Sidon, was a pagan place. In fact, throughout the whole of the Old Testament, you'll know that God had... Um, or God's people had battles with the Canaanites. They were a very evil nation, notorious for their paganism. And yet, Jesus didn't see that as a barrier for going into that place. Mark's Gospel tells us in the same account that Jesus actually went to a house. Maybe he wanted some rest. He'd been on busy ministry and he was going to a house, but he wasn't going to get any rest there. So, that's the first thing to notice. Notice also that he deals with a woman. And in the King James Version, it doesn't come out in the uh, NIV. Do you use the church by the NIV? Yes. It doesn't actually come out in the NIV. But it actually says, behold a woman. And whenever you study a little hint, always try and use a variety of Bibles. Because you won't see that word, behold in the NIV, but you do see it in the King James, which I think is a, is a more reliable source. Anyway, behold. Why use that word behold? Well, it's almost like the writer is saying, look, look in amazement. Look what Jesus is doing. Not only is he meandering through a pagan nation, but he's actually having dealings with women. And you might think, well, what's the big issue there? Well, of course, in those days, particularly amongst the Jews, women were very, very much seen as inferior citizens. And they used to pray that prayer, didn't they? Lord, I thank God that I am uh, not a woman, and I thank God that I am not a Gentile. That was a Jewish prayer. Well, of course, Jesus wasn't having any of that. In fact, if you look through the Gospels, Jesus has a lot of interaction with women. We could go through that and that could be a sermon in and of itself. Behold a woman. He's going to deal with a woman. And you can imagine the disciples saying, what are you doing here again? It's not easy coming here to, to, to a pagan nation. But he's talking to a woman. Thank God that he breaks down barriers. Religious barriers. Social barriers. But also, this is a contrast with the previous chapter. Not sorry, not the previous chapter, the previous passage. If you read through the previous passage, and we won't go through it now because of time, Jesus is having dialogue with the scribes and the Pharisees. They take a lot of pride in the fact that they are Jews, the chosen nation. They have the temple. They have all the religious paraphernalia that goes with their so-called religion. How different is this woman? No temple, no scriptures, no nothing. Just coming as she is, with nothing to offer. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. So that's a contrast, it's a contrast I think to show you, well Jesus is having, walking away from all the religious people, taking time to home in 
on one individual, insignificant, pagan woman. And to start off with, that's a great encouragement to us, isn't it? Mm -hmm. No matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter what your past is, no matter your status, no matter what, Christ is interested in everyone. So that's the first thing to notice. Notice her dire need in verse 22. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Now, is there anything worse, those of you who know who are parents, or grandparents even, is there anything worse than when your children are ill? There isn't, is that it's almost, well, it is worse than when we are ill. We fret over them. We worry about them. And so I guess here this woman is very anxious. She has a desperate need. And the reason she comes to Jesus is because she knows that he alone can meet that need. A pagan woman. We keep emphasizing. A pagan woman. But notice she includes herself in the request. Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. <laughs> Isn't she coming to ask for a request about her daughter? Well, yes, she is. But is there a sense here where she sees her need, perhaps even more than her daughter's? Lord, have mercy on me. Maybe she thinks, well, if he has mercy on me, she will, he will also have mercy on my daughter as well. I don't know. But she includes herself in this desperate situation. And of course, we, as believers, often are in dire need. And it's at those times, and God sends them, I believe, to us, those times when we say, Lord, help me. Otherwise, we would carry on quite happily, in our pride, thinking that we're doing okay. And if God didn't bring those difficulties into our lives, who knows, we could stray away from Him. Notice also she makes, well, she attributes to Jesus Jewish titles. Lord, Son of David, now a pagan should never say that. Have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Lord, she says, son of David. Two very Jewish names. It's almost like she's pleading. Lord, I know you are a God of the Jews. And I know that you have said she perhaps knew a little bit about the Old Testament. My guess is, and I could be wrong on this, there's no sure way of knowing, that others have gone to the ministry of Jesus, gone back to Canaan, and maybe shared the gospel with her. And she's got this knowledge of Christ, and she wants to come to him, and she wants to make use of that knowledge of God. Perhaps that's a more reasonable explanation. I don't know. But she comes to the one who can save her. And then we have in verse 23, Jesus did not answer a word. Not he didn't hear her, he didn't answer her. Didn't answer a word. Why? We know that God answers prayer. And we know that he does it instantly. But on this occasion, he doesn't answer her word. So she's had a terrible discouragement here. She'd come, disturb Jesus in, in the house that he probably at, made a bit of a kerfuffle, and when she does ask him for a request, what does he do? He ignores her. Terrible discouragement in seeking God. Why would he do that? Well, we know it's the test of her faith. Is she really desiring Christ. We'll come back to that a little bit later on. And then the need, there's another barrier here. The disciples also chip in. Lord, send her away. She's getting on our nerves. 
Why would they say that? I wonder whether this woman's come along to Jesus, found Jesus unresponsive, although he isn't, and thought, well, I'll ask the disciples instead. Maybe they can help me. Or maybe they can ask Jesus. Maybe they'll have some leverage with him. So they're getting rather, rather flustered about this. Lord, send it away. She's a nuisance. So she got another discouragement. So we've got the first discouragement. Jesus doesn't answer her. The second discourage, discouragement. Uh, the disciples want to shoo her away. And then Jesus uh, seems to put up another barrier. In verse 24, he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So there's three discouragements. I'm sorry, Jesus seems to be saying, you're not included in the plan of salvation, he seems to be saying. <coughs> but of course the question arises, if Jesus has got no intention of saving this woman, why does he go to Cana in the first place? And then she does something rather remarkable. She worshipped him. She wasn't put off by those obstacles. I wonder whether you and I are put off by obstacles. When we pray, and the Lord doesn't answer us, we have good reasons for doing that. And then we pray again. Maybe our children, unbelievers, family, friends, colleagues. And we pray again. And the Lord just does not seem to answer us. And we're thinking, is he really interested? Is he really bothered? Does he really hear my prayer? This woman bowed and prayed, Lord, help me. What a short prayer that is. Three words. Lord, help me. Faith does not require massive prayers. I go into all the doctrinal details. Lord, help me. We know that Peter, when he was sinking on the ship, what did he say? Lord, save me. Three words. Quite often the shortest prayers are the most effective in God's eyes. Now, of course, we should pray longer prayers. They're not always short prayers. But there are situations, Lord, help me to witness. Lord, help me to resist that sin. Lord, help me to be more courageous. Lord, increase my faith. Just little prayers that can help us be the Christian that God wants us to be. And then there's another discouragement in verse 26. It says, he replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. He's calling it a dog. Now we know in those days that if you were a Gentile, they used to call them the Gentile dogs. It was a derogatory term. And it was the term that they used to categorise anybody really who was a non-Jew. So whether you were from Greece or Cyprus or Canaan, you were a Gentile dog. And you would think that at this point the woman would say, well, okay, I'm off. I've had it from the disciples, the Lord's discouraged me, and he's still not listening to me. I've even fallen down at his feet. So we have that discouragement. But she doesn't give in. She's tenacious. True Lord, she says in verse 27, yet the dog eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And then at that point, Jesus commends her for her mega, which is what the word means, great, mega, faith. She's saying in effect, Lord, I just need a crumb. Just give me a crumb from beneath your table and I'll be satisfied. You, you can do that for me. Yes, the bread is for the Jews, but just give me a crumb now. Now, eventually the, the Gentiles would we know when the New Testament era comes, the floodgates of the gospel would be open to the Gentiles. But at this point, it wasn't available. It has, through the cross and Pentecost, which hadn't yet occurred, that would happen, but it hadn't yet occurred at this particular moment in time. And then Jesus says to her, 
your faith is great. Woman, verse 28, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And, now listen to this, her daughter was healed that very hour. Doesn't mention that she was forgiven, although I believe she was. Jesus had answered both of her prayers. To be merciful to her and to save her daughter from demon possession. And there we have a summary of those verses. Tremendous thing to have Jesus say of any believer, your faith is great. How can we get to that point? It's a lifelong process. And I've just got just a couple of things that I've written down that maybe we could think about. We could learn how to approach God properly. With humility, this woman was humble. She didn't strut around like you see some Christians on certain TV programs. And I don't know about you, but I cringe sometimes when I see these gospel um, personalities, we'll call them. And they seem to have this knack of approaching God with all this confidence. Lord, do this. Lord, do that. No. Humility. That is a must. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Tenacity. She wasn't going to give in. And I think we give in far too often, don't we? I've got a book at home which actually gives you the original. I can't speak Greek. But the translation of this was very, very interesting. It says this of when the lady approached Jesus. Having come, she fell upon her knees and touched her forehead to the ground. That's what it literally means. In profound reverence of him. If we're going to get anything from the Lord, we have to have a sense of humility, of God who we are coming to, and a sense of reverence. Not flippant, but reverence. Notice she came with a crumb, but went home with a loaf. Just a little bit of faith. That's what God can do for us. Remember, Paul says God is able to do exceedingly above all that we ask or even think. She was persistent. Paul again says, pray without ceasing in Thessalonians. Pray without ceasing as a church. Pray without ceasing as individuals. Pray without ceasing. Don't give up. We could look at the parables that Jesus gave, teaching us about persistent prayer, which is really hard, but absolutely necessary for us. And God will eventually bless that. And James were told, you have not. Why? Because you ask not. You've given in asking. So I'm not going to answer your prayers. God is not obliged to answer our prayers if we don't ask. He may do. But he's not obliged to. She must have been prepared, this is another lesson, to give up everything to follow Christ. She'd given up her pagan religion. She'd given up possibly her family because she knew to follow Christ was far, far better. Perhaps she'd consulted her religious gods or her religion was empty. It didn't satisfy. It didn't have any power to save and transform. And she knew that only Christ could help her and change her. And I'd just like to close with this one point. There is no reason why Jesus should have took that route. He was on his way to Jerusalem. And he goes off track. Why? Well, he wanted to make contact with that woman. He wanted to draw out her faith. And that's a tremendous encouragement to us as individuals. God is interested in each and every one of us. And that's a fantastic encouragement for us to take into our daily lives. He went off the beaten track to find this woman and to have her saved. And she would have went back, she was told to go back and share what God had done for them. So, 
great bake. If I was to give myself a mark out of 10, and I don't suggest you do this, I wonder what I would give myself. Not very good most of the time. Well, may God help us to have the tenacity of this lady and to lay hold of Christ who is willing and able to answer our prayers. Amen.